uh, do Rachel's uh, master's thesis defense today. Um, I think we are, the way that this is going to work is we'll ask Rachel to give us a presentation of her work for about 30 minutes. And then uh, what we'll do after that is we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. Um, and I would ask that the committee members sort of refrain from asking questions at this time, just to allow the audience members to participate. And then I'll invite the audience to leave the Zoom room and the committee members will have a more in-depth Q&A with uh, Rachel after that. So uh, sound good? Awesome. Thanks for being here on a Friday. Um, I know it's the Friday before spring break, so all the more important to recognize that uh, appreciate your uh, attendance. So with, without further ado, Rachel, I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Good, okay. So, uh, my name is Rachel Tarbett. Um, I'm, my, and my thesis is Understanding the Links Between Refugees and Water in Urban Refugee Camp Jordan. Um, I'm getting my MA in Applied Geography and Geospatial Science. Um, and the reason why um, I'm interested in this subject is because it really does combine both my <clears throat> master's program and my undergraduate um, degree. Um, I'm also just very interested in Middle Eastern history as well. Okay, um, first I wanna briefly talk about the history of water in the Middle East um, and all I'm, everything I'm gonna be saying today uh, happened after the turn of the 19th century. Um, and this is on the screen as a map of the Middle East, um, but it's important to note that uh, what countries are in the Middle East is really dependent on the discipline you're talking about. So the Middle East is largely arid to semi-arid, um, and there's a diverse topography from mountain ranges to inland seas. Um, it's often misclassified as one large desert but we know that to be untrue. Um, and despite the general aridity of the desert, the region is still home to many famous water bodies, including the Red Sea, the Dead Sea, as well as the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, and it's important to avoid generalizations as water resources look wildly different from country to country. It's also important not to generalize when it comes to people as well, because it often sets a precedent that results in a lot of what we're going to be discussing today. So the reason I'm focusing on the Jordan River Basin um, is that the situation uh, in these countries is both unique and not. And it can be construed as a microcosm of a lot of problems and water resource issues that all, his, uh, all countries will eventually be facing. And the history of the region is also just very fascinating. So there are five countries in the Jordan River Basin, which is Jordan, Israel, Palestine, which is often featured on maps as the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which is what it has been uh, seen on here and Lebanon. Um, and even among these five countries, the levels of water scarcity vary widely. The state of Jordan is almost completely landlocked except for a port on the Red Sea and it's subhumid to hyper arid. Israel and Palestine have a Mediterranean climate with an average of 1200 millimeters of precipitation a year. Lebanon has a Mediterranean climate as well with a variance of 250 millimeters to 1650 millimeters depending on where in the country you are. Syria is arid to semi-arid and also has a wide range of precipitation at 200 millimeters to 1,000 millimeters. And it's important to note here that uh, water resources are not distributed equally, even in this incredibly small area. And this is, uh, this is just an image of the Jordan River network. Um, so you can understand where this river is. You can see Lebanon and Syria at the top, Jordan, uh, the West Bank and then Israel. And for some reason, I don't know why uh, the Gaza Strip is left off of this map. So what is a refugee? Um, a refugee is someone who has been forced to flee his or her country because of persecution, war, or violence. A refugee faces persecution because of nationality, race, religion, political opinion, or membership to a social group. And they are unlikely to be able to return to their home country because of this fear. And this should be distinguished from an IDP, which is an internally displaced person who has been forced to flee their home, but never cross an international border. 
IDPs are placed in a particularly vulnerable position as they are not protected by international law or eligible to receive various types of aid because they are still under the protection of their own governments. Almost 83% of refugees in Jordan are living outside of designated refugee camps and 50 to 60% of the Jordanian population are Palestinian refugees or descendants of Palestinian refugees, though this number is highly politicized and contested. However, there are many people who do not have these labels and therefore do not receive international recognition or aid. We know this firsthand in the United States as we hear stories of people being turned away at borders beside, uh, because they do not meet refugee status despite being forcefully driven from their home countries. In Jordan, NGOs are faced with the task of assisting refugees inside and outside of refugee camps. They are continuously struggling to meet the demands for food, water, health, care, and education, among other things. Though Palestinian refugees have fared relatively well in terms of treatment in Jordan, with many being provided citizenship, jobs, and shelter, they are still subject to coordinated political attacks from uh, government officials. And uh, the peril of Palestinian refugees in Jordan is not a solitary interest incident and instead indicative of a much larger problem. Um, to understand the refugee population in Jordan, we first have to understand the history that made refugees who they are today in this area. Um, in 1923, when Jordan, then called Transjordan, was severed from the Palestinian territory, it was only the size of Indiana and had a population of 350,000. Transjordan was more of an area that one moved through to get to a larger city, such as Damascus in modern day Syria, than it was a country as we define it today. After World War II, the British Empire could no longer justify their continued stay in Palestine and in response, the U United Nations uh, gathered the UNSCOP, which is the United Nations Special Committee of Palestine, in order to debate the fate of Palestine. In 1947, the UNSCOP came up with the partition plan, calling for the end of the British mandate and the separation of the state into Jewish and Arab territories. While most of the Arab countries rejected this partition plan, Abdullah, uh, who is the, was the king of Jordan at the time and pictured on the screen, saw the opportunity to expand his state borders. Absorbing the Palestinian territories would give him access to natural resources, as well as the port of Aqaba on the Red Sea. Both the 1948 war and the 1967 war led to huge influxes of Palestinian refugees into all of the Jordan River Basin countries. In addition, Abdullah got his wish and was able to annex the West Bank into Transjordan during the 1948 war. Before then, Transjordan had a population of 500,000, and afterwards the population had reached 1.5 million. And uh, it's important to note that even though Abdullah was seeking to expand his territory, the coming years would show how ill-equipped the country actually was to handle such a tremendous population increase. And as of 2010, the number of Palestinian refugees and their descendants that were uh, registered with the UNRWA which, uh, which is the UN Palestinian organization, was over 1.9 million. Um, if anyone is wondering, this is a picture is uh, of Petra and the bank, which is the most uh, prominent picture that you see on the internet is on the other side of this rock formation. And you can actually walk up here and stand on top of it if you want. <laughs> um, so water was considered a sleeping resource one that was endlessly new, renewable for a long time in Jordan. And it wasn't until 1995 that the Jordanian government became aware of the growing water crisis and published its water strategy policy. Currently, Jordan consumes more water than is available from its renewable and non-renewable resources. Water shortages have caused the beginnings of illegal extractions with thousands of illegal wells being created. More than 90% of rainfall in Jordan becomes runoff on roadways and evaporates before infiltration into groundwater can take place. Groundwater is still being used at twice the rate at which it recharges. Agricultural um, agriculture it consumes almost 50% of the total water supply. Unaccountable water losses such as leakage or theft is accountable for 50% of water reuse in urban networks. And the FAFO Foundation has already proven the connection between water availability per person to population growth in Jordan as population go, uh, grows, water availability goes down. Um, so with all that being said, my research questions are as follows. Where and what are the points of intersection between the Palestinian 
uh, refugee populations and water governance in Jordan. How has water insecurity in Irvid impacted the refugees that live there? And two, what are the implications of these connections for water resource management in Irvid, Jordan, and relative to other parts of the world? So I based a lot of my arguments in the discussion section based on two frameworks. The first uh, is Garrett Hardin's uh, Tragedy of the Commons. Um, and he wrote this paper in 1968 and it points to perceived difficulties in population growth and resources and points the blame of pollution or environmental degradation on those who are breeding. And Diana K. Davis begins her book, The Arid Lands, by discussing the failings of international policy in the largest international organization, the UN, of understanding deserts, of misunderstanding deserts and other arid lands. Davis's desertification is important because Arabs have con been conti uh, continuously blamed for what is considered the decline, decline of Arabia since the fall of biblical Eden. These blatantly racist views of those who are native to what is now called Israel, Palestine, and Jordan developed into the policies that the French and English used to rule over and develop their colonial territories and arid zones. Their views became the dominant understanding globally. These ideas have morphed and are displayed in the dominant views toward refugees in terms of water resources. I am able to apply this to a study of refugees and water resources in Jordan in that excessive refugee populations are also are often blamed for water resource scarcity. So just a quick overview on my methods. Um, so I, the Auraria database was used to search for a variety of academic publications. This led me to publish books, peer reviewed journal articles, completed literature reviews, news stories and articles. Um, which were then used to shape the research questions, interpret data, and write final discussion and conclusion. Uh, my committee was also consulted and fundamental to steering my research in the correct direction. I used data from international non-governmental organizations, such as the UNHCR, in order to generate, generate maps that highlighted the connection between population, refugees, and water resource issues. Um, data was also used to help the reader understand spatial concepts, such as the expansion of Urbid, where Urbid Refugee Camp is located, <clears throat> and the expansion of water resource projects. And I used ArcGIS Pro to use all, uh, in order to visualize all of the data found. Um, to make the maps, I used a combination of clipping, hill shading, and cartographic skills. Um, I first year referenced uh, the urban expansion map of Urbid um, onto a modern day topography based map found in ArcPro and then added feature classes later on. Okay, so why a case study? Um, a case study is an empirical inquiry that closely examines a contemporary phenomenon within its real world context. Using a specific case allows a study of a specific occurrence in it, which can then be expanded on to explain a larger phenomenon, which in this case is refugees and water resource issues. <clears throat> the case for this study will be a refugee camp slash town in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. So Urbid is both a governant, which is shown in red on this map, um, and it's also, which is similar to a state, it's also a city, which is highlighted by the yellow star, and Urbid refugee camp is settled within that city. So that's kind of confusing, and I'm going to try to be as clear as possible which one I'm talking about. At the turn of the century, Urbid consisted of 50 houses and only 350 residents. It was not until the 1940s that there was an exponential population increase as Palestinian refugees were forced into migration from Palestine to Jordan. The original Urbid camp was one of four established in Jordan, uh, created in 1951 on an area of about 2.24 square kilometers, which is around 0.15 square miles. It originally housed 4,000 residents which considering the city of Urbid was only had 7,000 residents was a large increase at 57%. Within three years, the inhabitants of the camp were replacing the temporary tents given to them with mud shelters and eventually concrete shelters reminiscent of the urban quarters within the city of Urbid. Then in 1967, the second large exodus of Palestinians took place, raising the population to above 40,000 just uh, in the city alone. When the second exodus of Palestinians took place, those who were poor moved into the Hussein camp, which is about 13 kilometers south of Urbid, while the wealthy moved within the city. And in 2021, almost 28,000 registered Palestinian refugees live in the Urbid uh, camp, 
31% of these refugees live in poverty. So my findings are not quantitatively conclusive, rather the following is an attempt to highlight the relationship between water and Palestinian refugees by using urban as a case study. Specifically, the main connection between Palestinian refugee populations and water governance in urban is population growth and the subsequent strain on natural resources. So this is the expansion map of urban over the years um, which is geo-referenced onto a topography map from ArcGIS. Um, and the yellow is the urban refugee camp, which was incorporated in 1953, which is two years after its creation. And the second wave, um, more areas were annexed, which is number five, uh, directly in the aftermath. Even uh, the city got bigger and bigger. So you can see that refugee populations were one of the reasons behind the expansion of refugee because increased population, which means that there was an acknowledgement that uh, population density was a problem in this area. Okay, so these are two maps. Uh, the yellow star is urban once again. Um, and it uh, these two figures uh, clearly illustrate how closely the connection between population and limited water resources are. The top map is the plotted drought hazard estimated by the integrated context analysis run by the UNDP in Jordan in 2019. And the bottom map is a population density map that was addressed to the country total of the United Nations population estimates in 2010. And uh, the urban government is right at the top around here, settled around the uh, yellow star. So I used 2019 data and 2010 data because that was what was available. This region is incredibly data poor. So I was very constrained in what is a publicly available to me. High population density to low population density is estimated by squared kilometers by number of people. The drought hazard is from the UNDP analysis uh, in Jordan based on data from 1980 through 2016. The decision to label drought hazard high through low was based upon a combination of natural and human related factors, including institutional capacity to account for drought. The high population density of both urban and the areas surrounding it is matched with the high measured high drought hazard. While population and population growth might not be the only contributing factor, it is likely to be a factor as population growth and density has a severe effect on the ability of a nation to provide its citizens with clean water. These maps not only point to a correlation between population density and drought hazard, but also to the increased vulnerability of refugees who are not able to control their access to water, instead are reliant on the UNRWA and the Jordanian government. Okay. So once again, this is, I use the expansion of urban map uh, georeference just in order to make it easier to see what's going on. Um, but the blue lines are water networks and you can see that it ex it does extend into the camp which is again number two uh, to the north um, and we can see in this map just how much urban has changed in the last 60 years in 1950 most citizens even outside the camp still did uh, not have running water never mind inside the camp instead water would be put into tanker-like trucks driven to living quarters and people then collected water from those trucks while water is often still intermittent, that's not an uncommon phenomenon in other parts of the country as well. Um, I found two major water resource projects in urban, one that has occurred in the 1960s and another that occurred in 1980s. Both these reference population growth and specifically the presence of refugees in urban as a significant factor in the approval of these projects. Both were funded by international organizations, the first from the International Development Organization and the other from USAID. The acknowledgement that the presence of refugees within urban was one of the reasons for the USAID and the World Bank to fund uh, water resource projects is an important one. It means that refugees are both the reason behind the rapid population growth and therefore pressure on the existing system, but also that they are the reason behind Jordan's inability to receive uh, ability to receive international aid for water resource projects. And uh, I, from my understanding, most of the uh, water network that you see was built in the uh, 60s and 80s by these international projects. 
Okay. So I was able to connect the arrival of Palestinian refugees to population density and then population density to high drought hazard. While it is impossible to know if the same level of population density would have occurred without Palestinian refugees, it is irrefutable that these refugees are contributing to population density in urban areas. Going back to the urban case study, before the arrival of refugees to urban, there was a mere 7,000 residents living there. With a sudden increase of population, it became a trend rather than an anomaly. With the increased population brought increased urbanization. So refugees, um, expe uh, especially in this area, can be both the heroes and the villains in water resource development. Jordan through the years has been able to leverage their status as a safe haven for refugees in order to receive international aid. Countries and international organizations provide aid in response to Jordan continuing to let refugees seek asylum within the state borders, which means that the presence of refugees in Urbid have brought benefits to even those who are not refugees. The citizens of Urbid who are not refugees are directly gaining things like more accessible clean water and better sanitation practices from the presence of refugees. There's also the opposite construction of refugees as the villain or the other. An imbalanced power structure, which is displayed in a refugee's relationship with their host country, engenders a lack of empathy and ultimately othering towards the less dominant party. Jordan as an institution has blamed the other for their uh, water resource issues. The dominant narrative allowed the Jordanian government to shift the blame of failing to react preemptively to refugees when they could have acted as a crisis mitigator. And this doesn't just happen in Jordan. Um, I found similar studies in Tanzania, Sudan, and Lebanon, which all show similar patterns. And also that sp uh, spatial stratification is a huge problem in terms of equity uh, in access to water. So the availability of resources between Palestinian refugees who live inside refugee camps and those who live outside is disproportionate. Those living inside camps are less likely to have access to amenities such as electricity, water, and sanitation. Refugees' annual income is substantially lower for those residing inside camps than those outside. Uh, these are fundamentally spatial inequality problems. When Palestinian refugees are living inside refugee camps, they are likely to have more health problems, less income and education, and less access to resources. Water quality has also been cited as an issue of concern in urban. 60% of refugee households outside of camps rely on filtered water, bought in gallons and, uh, gallons and bottled water. Negative perception of the net water network included turbidity, taste, and chlorine smell. Safety is often a subject of concern, specifically fear of contamination. The additional cost of buying bottled water can be up to 25% of Jordanian average monthly income and has a severe financial impact on those who are lower income. And it's a, uh, just as a reiteration, 31% of those who live in urban refugee camp are living in poverty. Despite fears, um, those living in camps are less likely to be able to afford bottled water and instead relied upon what was piped to their homes. This also matters because of the infrequency that water is piped. In, water is piped. While most refugees within camps were satisfied with the amount given to them, they would be unable to supplement if there were to be shortages or outages in the network. Um, so before getting to my final recommendations, I want to go back to my initial research questions and answer them directly in case any clarity was lost along the way. So first, where and what are the points of intersection between Palestinian refugee populations and water governance in Jordan? Palestinian refugee populations drive the overall narrative behind water governance as a result of dramatic population growth and gives the Jordanian government the ability to leverage their position as a refugee safe haven to garner, garner international resource and monetary support. Population growth and density has a direct impact on the availability and quality of water resources for both refugees and naturalized citizens of Jordan. Uh, 1A was how has water insecurity and in urban impacted the refugees that live there? Water insecurity directly impacts refugees in urban by emphasizing the spatial relationships that they have with water. Because urban has such a high population density, drought and water insecurity is much more likely to occur. And because it is much more likely to occur, those that are the most vulnerable within the cities are most likely to be impacted by water shortages and outages. You can see this happening with refugees outside of camps having access to bottled water in order to supplement their own piped water distribution. 
Those living in camps are more likely to be uh, to, ha to have a lower income and cannot afford the added luxury of increasing their drinking water supply separate from the municipal grid. And two, what are the implications of these connections for water resource management in urban Jordan and relative to the other part of the world? The problem with refugees fleeing violent conflict, subsequent population growth and the environmental problems that come along with it are, these are not issues that only exist in Jordan. Similar situations have and are occurring in Tanzania, Lebanon, and Sudan. Jordan is a semi-arid country, and it makes sense that in these areas with higher populations, there is more likely to be a disconnect between demand for water and water availability. Even knowing this, it is important to remember that refugees are not the sole proprietors of environmental degradation. You cannot place the blame of environmental issues solely on the most vulnerable people in your society. So, Finally, uh, my recommendations. My recommendations would be to use a combination of integrated water resource management and participatory planning. So IWRM is defined by the Global Water Partnership as a process which promotes the coordinated development and management of water, land, and related resources to maximize the resultant economic and social welfare in an equitable manner without compromising the sustainability of vital ecosystems. Uh, it's a holistic uh, approach to understanding complex systems. Instead of seeing a river as a single entity, the IWRM understands the biophysical, social, political, cultural, and economic aspects of the system, which can then be used to meet the goals of relevant stakeholders, and it attempts to include all relevant stakeholders from the beginning. Unfortunately, for those attempting to solve the water sustainability problems in the Jordan River Basin, the difficulties they are facing are from a very complex system. Water resource managers have to contend not only with the conflicts within their own countries, but also how their neighbors might be affected as well. Because many of the problems in water resource management affecting the Jordan River Basin include edge or boundary issues that need to be integrated into solutions. Uh, these issues need to be integrated into solutions uh, that will benefit everyone in the long run. And the uh, IWRM method is a good uh, fit for this situation. Participatory planning takes stakeholder involvement even further. A participatory planning approach is one where everyone who has a stake in the process can voice their opinions, whether it be in person or by representation. One of the largest spatial divides examined within this uh, thesis is those with access to bottled water and those without access. The founding of this divide is the lack of trust that civilians have in their municipal water systems because of perceived contamination and or the quality of water being pumped into their homes. To dissuade this trust, it is important that community members are able to express their discomfort and need when it comes to the water systems they have a stake in and may understand better than those on a national level. A lot of the misunderstandings that come from water resource management is based on misinformation and a lack of transparency, both of which participatory planning is often able to solve. Both these, uh, both uh, IWRM and participatory planning are important steps to understanding how to properly manage water resources. However, neither of these processes are likely to come easy. Jordanian law still criminalizes speech that is critical of the king, foreign countries, or government institutions and officials. While Jordanians are not required to seek government permission to have gatherings, the Jordanian government has canceled gatherings without explanation. If uh, civilians are afraid of persecution, they're unlikely to participate or even attend stakeholder meetings. The water resource issues in Jordan are a fundamental problem with the system in place rather than a singularly refugee problem. Refugee organizations blaming for environmental degradation, refugees for environmental degradation, instead of taking responsibility for the misplacement and mismanagement of refugee camps is not acceptable and governments blaming refugees for environmental degradation instead of taking responsibility in their own role of mismanaging natural resources and failing to adapt to new circumstances is also not acceptable. It is important, to, is important for organizations who are in charge of vulnerable people to take responsibility for their own mistakes instead of taking placing the blame on people who aren't able to defend themselves. However, a one size Fits all uh, fit solution will never be a solution for all because the uh, situation in Jordan is unique because of the sheer volume of refugees and the historical acceptance of refugees into the country. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> um, but first, yeah, I want to thank my committee, which is 
Brian, Raphael, and Dale. Dale's from the history department. Thanks for being on my committee and taking the time out of your busy schedule to do that. Um, like to thank the department, specifically Marone, for reminding me of all the deadlines that I definitely would have missed. Um, and then thanks to my mom for coming and also my friends who also came. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's it. <laughs> Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, and uh, we'll open it to questions from the audience. There are any. <laughs> you mentioned um, sort of the idea of participatory um, involvement in water resource management and planning. And then you also mentioned sort of the issue of the, the cross-border um, situation, where it's not, you're not dealing with one country, it's issues crossing borders with so many different conflicts and details and things going on. So what do you think, how do you implement participatory planning or what do you think is potentially a good way to implement that participatory planning across borders, especially yeah. in the context of refugees? I think uh, participatory planning is best done, at least in this situation on smaller scales, especially in urban. Um, integrated resource management might be a better fit for large scale um, uh, resource management, uh, as I think it's our, it's has been implemented in some cases in Israel, um, but in urban, um, it's really a matter of distrust in the resources that are supposed to sustain them. And so, in my opinion, it's more important to do it on these like small scale things. So having refugees be involved in water resource management so that they have a better understanding of how that works. And unfortunately, um, when it comes to the Jordanian government, um, it's a lot easier for them to just um, steamroll that process altogether. Um, but if they wanna move, a, if they want people, especially people who have in the past been uh, persecuted, they need to make sure that that is an open process versus just a closed one. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah, I hope that answered that question. I have a question. Go ahead, Mom. <laughs> um, is there a governing body in the refugee camp that is uh, like has a, a a Jordanian representative on it, or how it is the how does that work with dealing with the water issues? Yeah, so my understanding is that uh, the UNRWA is kind of a go-between uh, between the Jordanian government and refugees. Um, as far as like a governing body, unless there, there, is, there is some kinds of voting, but as far as like whether people who aren't citizens or who are not government officials get to have a say in how their water is managed, I have no idea. It doesn't seem like it. It seems like the answer would be no. Okay. Other questions? Cool. Oh, I have I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, because of sanitation issues, because of the lack of water, um, did you uh, come across any data on COVID-19 in the refugee camps and um, cases there and how that's affected them? I know that there is some reports, um, specifically in urban that there are cases of COVID-19, but they aren't being reported on. And 
uh, I think probably the government would prefer that they aren't reported on. Um, I know that there has been steps to kind of, and one of the problems is, is that, you know, you have 28,000 people living in an incredibly small area. So if COVID-19 is a huge problem, it's going to be, or COVID-19 goes to there, it's going to be a huge problem. Um, I haven't heard anything about vaccine distribution. Um, it's likely it's not gonna happen for a while. Yeah, and you did say it was a very data poor area, so that makes sense. Yeah, and it's it that's both by design um, and also just because there isn't the uh, infrastructure or money to have that kind of intense data like we have in the U.S., where it's basically free. Yeah. Also, security issue as well. Yeah. Thank you. I have one other question. Have you have you um, heard anything at all about black market selling of water in the refugee camp or in the in the surrounding areas? Um, so there is a lot of illegal wells, um, and I think it's more when you get further into the east because it's there's a lot of land to cover, um, and there's not as much uh, the population density pretty much disappears. Um, it's basically people who are living in like military camps or people who are, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, or, or there's like small towns and outposts and stuff, but the more, res, uh, like the more towns that are like further out, I wouldn't surprise me at all if those are like the main people who are doing illegal wells, because it's likely that there's, if they're so far out, it's likely they're still getting their water in tanker trucks um, and it's also likely that that water isn't enough to sustain them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if nobody okay. has other question, I will have, I will ask you this one because it's very general and probably of interest for everyone. <clears throat> you mentioned a case in Tanzania. Uh, I was there a couple of years ago and I didn't hear anything about that. Could you tell us briefly what you saw? What is this thing about? Yeah, so I'm actually, I think it was, uh, it was actually done by a student at the University of Denver. I think she was a PhD student. She got funding from the UNHCR to do this study. And it essentially, what happened was that in the northern part of Tanzania, um, the UNHCR put a refugee camp down that was 500 meters from an incredibly um, ecologically fragile forest. And when inevitable environmental degradation happened because of lack of infrastructure and in camps, sanitation issues, uh, locals hunting and selling food or selling meat to refugees because it wasn't part of their diet, the Tanzanian government and the UNHCR went back on it and said basically, the refugee, this is the refugees fault. Like, because they're there, this is their fault, ignoring the fact that they had no say in where this refugee camp went. <laughs> they had no say in like their diet. And so they were trying to supplement what they uh, were getting, uh, which was, I think, very basic and they never had meat. So they were trying to supplement their diet. And it wasn't them going out and hunting. It was actually the villagers who were hunting and then selling it back. So it's, it's just this like, we made a mistake, but instead of taking the responsibility, we're gonna blame the people that uh, are just living their lives, essentially, trying to survive. Yeah. Okay. Great, any other questions from folks here? All good. Okay, well, thanks everybody uh, for being here. Um, we will, um, the committee will stay behind um, and um, appreciate you all being here for Rachel's uh, presentation. Thanks. Thanks everyone.